The name of this video is uh, Infinite Solenoid. We can regard an infinite solenoid as a degenerate case of a toroidal solenoid where the radius of the toroidal solenoid, which I will explain in a minute, goes to infinity. This is an approximation as much as a parallel capacitor with infinite plates is an approximation. It works very well though. For example, this is the calculation I utilized to determine the self-inductance of an infinite solenoid, like the solenoid I used to make my AM radio. So it works really, really well, as long as the tube, which I used in that case, and the number of coils was long enough, then the approximation is very good. That is, the fringing effects of the borders are small. So it's a very important result. So again, let's consider um, our toroidal solenoid, as we have seen up until now. So this is our toroidal solenoid. And of course, there is a cross-sectional area here with some vacuum, as always, similarly here, the vacuum in between, this is filled up, as always. In this case, let's say that this is the center of the solenoid, and let's say that this distance to the axis gamma Q1 from the origin O to the axis gamma, the longitudinal axis of the solenoid, let's say that this distance is small r. In the limit for small r that goes to plus infinite, effectively this bending radius becomes so large that this opens up to be an infinite solenoid of this form. It's like a tube, like the tube in my AM radio. So clearly the bending radius is infinite for a straight line. Okay, and so in this case, uh, the way we do it again is by coiling up around this core, a coil like this, etc. with many loops. And again, we have uh, capital N loops, okay? For a certain distance, let's say that this one will be a distance length small l for the uh, solenoid, we have n loops for this length, okay? And the area here associated with one of these loops, so let's call it uh, simply A, an area A, okay? It's a sigma surface, open surface, and it's an area A. All right, so then now that we know that, we expect that the magnetostatic field that will go in this direction, because it has to go, suppose that the current goes in this direction, so it flows like this, this is my current I, so right hand rule is the same as here, so if the current goes like this, the magnetic field we expect will be in this direction here, this would be our expected B, okay, however, it's going to be different than in the case of the solenoid, okay, of the toroidal solenoid, because here we had the we had an R dependence here, we are not going to have it because of this limiting case, and let's see how this works. Let's use the equations we already have. So uh, we already know that the magnetic field B of a toroidal solenoid is equal to a mu naught and I divided by 2 pi R, of course you are pi, in the usual coordinate system, which I'm not going to sketch here, same your coordinate system. Now, in this case, we need to use densities because we are considering an infinite structure. Therefore, we move from capital N to small n, which will be equal to capital N divided by L, because we have n loops over n distance small l. Uh, this, in fact, can also be written in the case of the toroidal solenoid or the torus. It can be written as n divided by 2 pi r. And then eventually we need to go in the limit for r that goes to plus infinite to reconcile everything here. And this also means that capital N can be written as small n, the density times the length. So we will use all of that. Let's in fact plug this in here. And so we end up having for the magnitude of B that the magnitude of B is going to be mu naught, capital N, which is small n L times I divided by 2 pi r, 
but this actually can be written as mu naught n 2 pi r, which is L, L is 2 pi r before doing the limit, times i divided by 2 pi r. Now we go in the limit for r that goes to plus the infinite of this quantity, and of course the limit simplifies quite a bit because we have uh, 2 pi r divided by 2 pi r. So in the Cauchy principal value mean, uh, in uh, interpretation of this limit, this 2 pi r and 2 pi r goes away, and so we simply get mu naught small n capital I. So this is the magnetic field, the magnetostatic field, uh, within the infinite solenoid, IS. And obviously, because of the right-hand rule, it has to point in this direction. But now, the only difference with, the, with respect to uh, the case of the threaded solenoid is that it's uniform. Does not depend on R anymore. So now that we know what the field is, we want to compute the flux over one of these uh, uh, areas here. So such a flux, it's equal to the flux over one of these loops, A, or actually let's call it uh, for simplicity, yeah, let's call it A, because that's what I call it here. And so this flux is nothing but BA, well, B infinite solenoid A, and so this B infinite solenoid A is nothing not but mu naught Ni times A. Okay, so now we want to go to the flux for N loops, and so we're going to get N times phi A, which is equal to mu naught, small n times capital N times I times A. But we know that capital N is an L, so eventually we can rewrite this as mu naught uh, n times n is n squared times L. Okay, so n, n squared, then n is an L, so L times A times I. And finally, the self-inductance, which has to be positive, is equal to the flux divided by uh, the current, so we get rid of this current and we obtain mu naught n squared L A. Okay? And so this is our final result here. The set inductance of the infinite solenoid, which again is the equation I used to compute the inductance of the coil in my AM radio, see the first video, is equal to mu naught small n squared, so the density of coil of uh, turns of, uh, of this coil per unit area, times the length of the coil I'm considering, of the solenoid I'm considering, times the cross sectional area. So again, when we deal with self-inductances, we notice that there is an n squared dependence, okay? Even though in this case is small n squared, and as always, self-inductance is this is a positive quantity. And you can also define it per unit length if you want, if you want divided by dividing by small l, and that's there would be the inductance per unit length if you want to do so. So to recap this video, what we have done here, we considered the general case of a toroidal solenoid with infinite radius. In this case, we obtain a straight infinite solenoid. Uh, we know what is the magnetostatic field of the toroidal solenoid before this limiting case. We just move to these definitions, and so then we do the limit, which allows us to get rid of this R dependence, so the limit doesn't bother us too much, and we obtain in this limiting case the uniform magnetic field, right hand rule, of course, uniform inside the infinite solenoid, which allows us to find the flux and therefore the inductance of this infinite solenoid, which causes a sense small square larger than zero. And as a matter of fact, this was the very last video of this course. That's it. Thank you.